Section 7 of the Aeneid. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Aeneid by Virgil. Translated by J. W. McHale. Book 4. The Love of Dido and Her End. Part 1. But the queen, long ere now pierced with sore distress, feeds the wound with her life blood and catches the fire unseen. Again and again his own valiance and his lines renown flood back upon her spirit. Look and accent cling fast in her bosom, and the pain allows not rest or calm to her limbs. The morrow's dawn bore the torch of Phoebus across the earth and had rolled away the dewy darkness from the sky, when, scarce herself, she thus opens her confidence to her sister. Anna, my sister, such dreams of terror thrill me through. What guest unknown is this who hath entered our dwelling? How high his mien, how brave in heart as in arms! I believe it well with no vain insurance. His blood is divine. Fear proves the vulgar spirit. Alas, by what destinies is he driven, what wars outgone he chronicled, were my mind not planted, fixed and immovable, to ally myself to none in wedlock, since my love of old was false to me in the treachery of death, were I not sick to hear of bridal torch and chamber, to this temptation alone I might happily yield. Anna, I will confess it. Since Sicius, mine husband, met his piteous doom, and our household was shattered by a brother's murder, he only hath touched mine heart, and stirred the balance of my soul. I know the prince of the ancient flame. But rather, I pray, may earth first yawn deep for me, or the Lord omnipotent hurl me with his thunderbolt into gloom, the pallid gloom and profound night of Erebus, ere I soil thee mine honor, or unloose thy laws. He took my love away, who made me one with him long ago. He shall keep it with him, and guard it in the tomb. She spoke, and dwelling tears filled the bosom of her gown. Anna replies, O oh, dearer than the daylight to thy sister, wilt thou waste, sad and alone, all thy length of youth, and know not the sweetness of motherhood, nor love's bounty? Deemest thou the ashes care for that, or the ghost within the tomb? Be it so, in days gone by, no wooers bent thy sorrow, not in Libya, not ere then in Tyre. Iribus was slighted, and other princes nurtured by the triumphal land of Africa. Wilt thou contend so with a love to thy liking? Nor does it cross thy mind whose are these fields about thy dwelling. On this side are thy Gaetulian towns, a race unconquerable in war the rainless Numidian riders, and the grim Syrtis hem thee in. On this lies a thirsty tract of desert swept by the raiders of Barca. Why speak of the war gathering from Tyre, and thy brother's menaces? With God's auspices to my thinking, and with Juno's favor, hath the Ilian fleet held on hither before the gale. What a city wilt thou discern here, O sister! What a realm will rise on such a union! The arms of Troy ranged with ours, what glory will exalt the Punic state! Do thou only, asking divine favor with peace offerings, be bounteous and welcome, and draw out reasons for delay, while the storm rages at sea, and Orion is wet, and his ships are shattered in the sky and voyageable. With these words she made the fire of love flame up in her spirit, put hope in her wavering soul, and let honor slip away. First they visit the shrines, and desire grace from altar to altar. They sacrifice sheep fitly chosen to Ceres the lawgiver, to Phoebus and Lord Leus, to Juno before all, guardian of the marriage bond. Dido herself, excellent in beauty, holds the cup in her hand, and pours libation between the horns of a milk-white cow, or moves in state to the rich altars before the gods' presences day by day renewing her gifts, and gazing athirst into the breasts of cattle laid open to take counsel from the throbbing entrails. Ah, witless souls of soothsayers! How many vows or shrines help her madness! All the while the subtle flame consumes her inly, and deep in her breast the wound is silent and alive. 
Stung to misery, Dido wanders in frenzy all down the city, even as an arrow-stricken deer, whom, far and heedless amid the Cretan woodland, a shepherd archer hath pierced and left the flying steel in her unaware. She ranges in flight the Dictian forest lawns, fast in her side clings the deadly reed. Now she leads Aeneas with her through the town, and displays her Sidonian treasure and ordered city. She essays to speak, and breaks off halfway in utterance. Now, as day wanes, she seeks the repeated banquet, and again madly pleads to hear the agonies of Ilium, and again hangs on the teller's lips. Thereafter, when all are gone their ways, and the dim moon in turn quenches her light, and the setting stars counsel to sleep, Alone in the empty house she mourns and flings herself on the couch he left. Distant, she hears and sees him in the distance, or enthralled by the look he has of his father, she holds Ascanius on her lap. If so, she may steal the love she may not utter. No more do the unfinished towers rise, no more do the people exercise in arms, nor work for safety in war on harbor or bastion. The works hang broken off. Vast looming walls and engines towering into the sky. So soon as she perceives her thus fast in the toils and madly careless of her name, Jove's beloved wife, daughter of Saturn, accosts Venus thus. Noble indeed is the fame and splendid the spoils you win, thou and that boy of thine, and the mighty renown of deity, if two gods have vanquished one woman by treachery. Nor am I so blind to thy terror of our town, thine old suspicion of the high house of Carthage. But what shall be the end, or why all this contest now? Nay, rather let us work on an enduring peace, and a bridal compact. But what shall be the end, or why all this contest now? Nay, rather let us work an enduring peace, and a bridal compact. Thou hast what all thy soul desired. Dido is on fire with love, and hath caught the madness through and through. Then rule we this people jointly, in equal lordship. Allow her to be a Phrygian husband's slave, and to lay her Tyrians for dowry in thine hand. To her, for she knew the dissembled purpose of her words, to turn the Teucrian kingdom away to the coasts of Libya, Venus thus began in answer. Who so mad as to reject these terms, or choose rather to try the fortune of war with thee, if only when done, as thou sayest, fortune follow. But I move an uncertainty of Jove's ordinance, whether he will that Tyrians and wanderers from Troy be one city, or approve the mingling of peoples in the treaty of union. Thou art his wife, and thy prayers may essay his soul. Go on, I will follow. Then Queen Juno thus rejoined, That task shall be mine. Now, by what means the present need may be fulfilled, attend, and I will explain in brief. Aeneas and Dido, alas and woe for her, are to go hunting together in the woodland when tomorrow's rising sun goes forth and his rays unveil the world. On them, while the beaters run up and down and the lawns are girt with toils, will I pour down a blackening rain cloud mingled with hail and startle all the sky in thunder. Their company will scatter for shelter in the dim darkness. Dido and the Trojan captain shall take refuge in the same cavern. I will be there, and if thy good will is assured me, I will unite them in wedlock, and make her wholly his. Here shall Hymen be present. The Cytherean gave ready assent to her request, and laughed at the wily invention. Meanwhile, dawn rises forth of ocean. A chosen company issue from the gates, while the morning star is high. They pour forth with meshed nets, toils, broad-headed hunting spears, Massilian horsemen, and sinewy sleuth-hounds. At her doorway the chief of Carthage await their queen, who yet lingers in her chamber, and her horse stands splendid in gold and purple, with clattering feet and jaws champing on the foamy bit. At last she comes forth amid a great thronging train, girt in a Sidonian mantle, broidered with needlework, her quivers of gold, her tresses knotted into gold. A golden buckle clasps up her crimson gown. Therewithal the Phrygian train advances with joyous Eulus, himself first and foremost of all, Aeneas joins her company and unites his party to hers, even as Apollo, when he leaves wintry Lycia and the streams of Xanthus to visit his mother's Delos, and renews the dance, while Cretans and Dryopes and painted Agathrysians mingle clamorous about his altars. 
Himself he treads the Scythian ridges, and plates his flowing hair with soft heavy sprays, and entwines it with gold. The arrows rattle on his shoulder, as lightly as he went Aeneas, such glow and beauty is on his princely face. When they are come to the mountain heights and pathless coverts, lo, wild goats driven from the cliff tops run down the ridge. In another quarter, stags speed over the open plain and gather their flying column in a cloud of dust as they leave the hills. But the boy Ascanius is in the valleys, exultant on his fiery horse, and gallops past one and another, praying that among the unwarlike herds a foaming boar may issue or a tawny lion descend to the hill. Meanwhile, the sky begins to thicken and roar aloud. A rain cloud comes down mingled with hail. The Tyrian train and the men of Troy and the Dardanian boy of Venus's son scatter in fear and seek shelter far over the fields. Streams pour from the hills. Dido and the Trojan captain take refuge in the same cavern. Primeval Earth and Juno, the bridesmaid, give the sign. Fires flash out high in air, witnessing the union, and nymphs cry aloud on the mountain top. That day opened the gate of death and the springs of ill, for now Dido recks not of eye or tongue, nor sets her heart on love in secret. She calls it marriage, and with this name veils her fall. Straightway rumor runs through the great cities of Libya, rumor, than whom none other is more swift to mischief. She thrives on restlessness and gains strength by going. At first small and timorous, soon she lifts herself on high and paces the ground with head hidden among the clouds. Her, one saith, Mother Earth, when stung by wrath against the gods, bore last sister to Coeus and Enceladus, fleet-footed and swift of wing, ominous, awful, vast, for every feather on her body is a walking eye beneath, wonderful to tell, and a tongue, and as many loud lips and straining ears. By night she flits between sky and land, shrilling through the dusk, and droops not her lids in sweet slumber. In daylight, she sits on guard upon tall towers or the ridge of the house roof, and makes great cities afraid, obstinate in perverseness and forgery no less than messenger of truth. She then exultingly filled the countries with manifold talk, and blazoned alike what was done and undone. When Aeneas is come, born of Trojan blood, on him beautiful Dido thinks no shame to fling herself. Now they hold their winter, long drawn through mutual caresses, regardless of their realms, and enthralled by passionate dishonor. This the pestilent goddess spreads abroad in the mouths of men, and bends her course right on to King Aearpus, and with her words fires his spirit and swells his wrath. He, the seed of Ammon, by a ravished Garamantian nymph, has built to Jove in his wide realms a hundred great temples, a hundred altars and consecrated the wakeful fire that keeps watch by night before the gods perpetually, where the soil is fat with the blood of beasts, and the courts blossom with pied garlands. And he, distracted, and on fire at the bitter tidings, before his altars, amid the divine presences often, it is said, bowed in prayer to Jove with uplifted hands. Jupiter, omnipotent, to whom the broidered cushions of their banqueting halls of the Morosian people now poor lenient offering, lookest thou on this? Or do we shudder vainly when our father hurls a thunderbolt, and do blind fires in the clouds and idle rumblings appall our soul? The woman who, wandering in our coasts, planted a small town on purchased ground, to whom we gave fields by the shore and laws of settlement, she hath spurned our alliance and taken Aeneas for lord of her realm. Now that Paris, with his effeminate crew, his chin and oozy hair swathed in the turban of Maeonia, takes off and keeps her, since to thy temples we bear oblation and hollow an empty name. In such words he pleaded, clasping the altars. The Lord omnipotent heard, and cast his eye on the royal city, and the lovers forgetful of their fairer fame. Then he addresses this charge to Mercury. Up and away, O sun! Call the breezes and slide down them on thy wings. Accost the Dardanian captain, who now loiters in Tyrian Carthage, and cast not a look on distant cities. Carry down my words through the fleet air. Not such a one did his mother most beautiful vouch him to us, nor for this twice rescued him from Grecian arms. But he was to rule in Italy, teeming with empire and loud with war, to transmit the line of Teucer's royal blood, and lay all the world beneath his law. 
If such glories kindle him in no wise, and he take no trouble for his own honour, does a father grudge his Ascanius the towers of Rome? With what device, or in what hope, loiters he among a hostile race, and casts not a glance on his Ausonian children in the fields of Lavinium? Let him set sail. This is the sum. Thereof be thou our messenger. He ended, his son made ready to obey his high command. And first he laces to his feet the shoes of gold that bear him high, winging over seas or land, as fleet as the gale, and then takes the rod wherewith he calls wan souls forth of Orcus, or sends them again to the sad depth of hell, gives sleep and takes it away and unseals dead eyes, in whose strength he courses the winds and swims across the tossing clouds. And now in flight he descries the peak and steep sides of toiling Atlas, whose crest sustains the sky, Atlas, whose pine-clad head is girt always with black clouds and beaten by wind and rain. Snow is shed over his shoulders for covering, rivers tumble over his aged chin, and his rough beard is stiff with ice. Here the Selenian, poised evenly on his wings, made a first stay, hence he shot himself sheer to the water, like a bird that flies low, skirting the sea about the craggy shores of its fishery. Even thus the brood of Selene left his mother's father, and flew, cutting the winds between sky and land, along the sandy Libyan shore. So soon as his winged feet reached the settlement, he espies Aeneas founding towers and ordering new dwellings. His sword twinkled with yellow jasper, and a cloak hung from his shoulders, ablaze with Tyrian sea-purple, the gift that Dido had made costly, and shot the warp with thin gold. Straightway he breaks in. Layest thou now the foundations of tall Carthage, and buildest up a fair city in dalliance? Ah, forgetful of thine own kingdom and state! From bright Olympus I descend to thee at express command of heaven sovereign, whose deity sways sky and earth. Expressly he bids me carry this charge through the fleet air. With what device, or in what hope, dost thou loiter idly on Libyan lands? If such glories kindle thee in no wise, yet cast an eye on growing Ascanius. On Ulysses, thine hope and heir, to whom the kingdom of Italy and the Roman land are due. As these words left his lips, the Cielian, yet speaking, quitted mortal sight, and vanished into thin air, away out of his eyes. But Aeneas in truth gazed in dumb amazement, his hair thrilled up, and the accents faltered on his tongue. He burns to flee away and leave the pleasant land, aghast at the high warning and divine ordinance. Alas, what shall he do? How venture to smooth the tale to the frenzied queen? What prologue shall he find? And this way and that he rapidly throws his mind, and turns it on all hands in swift change of thought. In his perplexity this seemed the better counsel. He calls Menesthus and Sergestus, and brave Serestus, and bids them silently equip the fleet, gather their crews on shore, and order their armament, keeping the cause of the commotion hid. Himself, meanwhile, since Dida the Gracious knows not, nor looks for severance to so strong a love, will essay to approach her when she may be told most gently, and the way for it be fair. All at once gladly do as bidden, and obey his command. But the queen, who may delude a lover, foreknew his devices, and at once caught the presaging stir. Safety's self was fear. To her likewise had evil rumor borne the maddening news that they equip the fleet and prepare for passage. Helpless at heart, she reels aflame with rage throughout the city, even as a startled Thyad in her frenzied triennial orgies, when the holy vessels move forth and the cry of Bacchus re-echoes, and Catheron calls her with night-long din. Thus, at last, she opens out upon Aeneas. And thou didst hope, traitor, to mask the crime, and slip away in silence from my land? Our love holds thee not, nor the hand thou once gavest, nor the bitter death that is left for Dido's portion. Nay, under the wintry star thou laborest on thy fleet, and hastenest to launch into the deep amid northern gales. Ah, cruel! Why, were thy quest not of alien fields and unknown dwellings, did thine ancient Troy remain? Should Troy be sought in voyages over tossing seas? Fliest thou from me? Me, who by these tears in thine own hand beseech thee, since naught else, alas, have I kept mine own, by our union and the marriage rites preparing, if I have done thee any grace, or aught of mine hath once been sweet in thy sight, pity our sinking house, and if there 
yet be room for prayers, put off this purpose of thine. For thy sake Libyan tribes and nomad kings are hostile, my Tyrians are estranged. For thy sake thine is mine honor perished, and the former fame my one title to the skies. How leavest thou me to die, O my guest, since to this the name of husband is dwindled down? For what do I wait till Pygmalion overthrow his sister city, or the Gaetulian Iarbus lead me to captivity? At least if before thy flight a child of thine had been clasped in my arms, if a tiny Aeneas were playing in my hall, whose face might yet image thine, I would not think myself ensnared and deserted utterly. She ended. He by counsel of Jove held his gaze unstirred, and kept his distress hard down in his heart. At last he briefly answers. Never, O queen, will I deny that thy goodness hath gone high as thy words can swell the reckoning. Nor will my memory of Elissa be ungracious while I remember myself, and breath sways this body. Little will I say in this. I never hoped to slip away in stealthy flight. Fancy not that. Nor did I ever hold out the marriage torch, or enter thus into alliance. Did fate allow me to guide my life by mine own government, and call my sorrows as I would? My first duty were to the Trojan city and the dear remnant of my kindred. The high house of Priam should abide, and my hand had set up Troy towers anew for a conquered people. But now for broad Italy hath Apollo of Grinos bid me steer, for Italy the oracles of Lycia. Here is my desire, this is my native country. If thy Phoenician eyes are stayed on Carthage towers and thy Libyan city, what wrong is it, I pray, that we Trojans find our rest on Ausonian land? We too may seek a foreign realm unforbidden. In my sleep, often as the dank shades of night veil the earth, often as the stars lift their fires, the troubled phantom of my father Anchises comes in warning and dread. My boy Ascanius, how I wrong one so dear in cheating him of an Asperian kingdom and destined fields. Now even the god's interpreter, sent straight from Jove, I call both to witness, hath borne down his commands through the fleet air. Myself in broad daylight I saw the deity passing within the walls, and these ears drank his utterance. Cease to madden me and thyself alike with plaints. Not of my will do I follow Italy. Long ere he ended, she gazes on him askance, turning her eyes from side to side and perusing him with silent glances. Then thus wrathfully speaks. No goddess was thy mother, nor Dardanus founder of thy line, traitor, but rough Caucasus bore thee on his iron crags, and the Hyrcanian tigresses gave thee suck. For what do I conceal it? For what further outrage do I want? Hath our weeping cost him a sigh, or a lowered glance? Hath he broken into tears, or had pity on his lover? Where, where shall I begin? Neither doth Queen Juno, nor our Saturnian lord, regard us with his righteous eyes. Nowhere is trust safe. Cast ashore and destitute, I welcomed him, and madly gave him place and portion in my kingdom. I found him his lost fleet, and drew his crews from death. Alas, the fire of madness speeds me on. Now, prophetic Apollo, now, oracles of Lycia, now the very god's interpreter sent straight from Jove through the air carries these rude commands. Truly that is work for the gods, a care to vex their peace. I detain thee not, nor gainsay thy words. Go, follow thine Italy down the wind, seek thy realm overseas. Yet midway my hope is, if righteous gods can do aught at all, thou wilt drain the cup of vengeance on the rocks, and re-echo calls on Dido's name. In murky fires I will follow far away, and when chill death hath severed body from soul, my ghost will haunt thee in every region. Wretch, thou shalt repay. I will hear, and the rumor of it shall reach me deep in the underworld. Even on these words she breaks off her speech unfinished, and, sick at heart, escapes out of the air, and sweeps round and away out of sight, leaving him in fear and much hesitance, and with much on his mind to say. Her women catch her in their arms, and carry her swooning to her marble chamber, and lay her on her bed. End of section 7